Hey everybody, welcome to nutrition Q&A number seven. I'm gonna start right now by answering some of your common nutrition questions, so let's go. The first topic is on macros for performance goals. And this kind of goes off of where I left off on the last nutrition Q&A. The goals are either endurance athlete training or strength athlete training, and they need different macro breakdowns the three macronutrients are carbs, proteins, and fats. So for endurance athlete training, the carb number will vary based on how active you are. It's in grams per kilogram, so it's a ratio based on your body weight. Three to five based on low activity, five to eight grams per kilogram for moderate activity, and eight to 10 grams per kilogram for high activity. So if you are doing high training versus low training, you need twice as many carbs. For endurance athlete protein, 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, and for fat, one gram per kilogram of body weight. So fat and protein are fixed numbers, and carbs varies based on how active you are. For strength and power athletes, carbs is a fixed number, five to six grams per kilogram of body weight for all strength training. Protein is 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram, so a lot higher, and fat is roughly 30% of your daily calories. So basically fill the rest of your calories in with fat, and if you follow the first two, five to six grams per kilogram carb, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram protein, then the rest of the calories should be fat. That should equal about 30%. So yeah, that's how it differs between endurance training and strength training. If you want to know how many calories to eat, check out this answer right here. Okay, the next question is about essential amino acids. Essential amino acids, the body does not produce them themselves, so they must be obtained from external sources. So essential amino acids are necessary for the body to maintain life, and there are nine essential amino acids. You can remember them with this acronym, FILTIVUM doesn't make it super easy, but the names for each amino acid are way more long and complex. I'm gonna go through them very quickly. Phenylalanine, 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 histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, tryptophan, threonine, valine, and methionine. These are the nine essential amino acids and your body does not make any of them. So you need to obtain them from your diet, from your food selections, any way that you can. What are polyphenols? Polyphenols come from plants and they have a lot of positive health impacts if you consume them. Plant polyphenols help increase memory and learning by helping your brain develop, reducing the risk of hypertension by improving vascular function, also inhibition of tumor development, so reducing the risk of developing cancer, and inhibition of neurodegeneration. So again, improving the quality of your brain. So yeah, plant polyphenols help majorly with all four of those factors, and I would try to get that into your diet if you could. Here are a few food sources that are rich in plant polyphenols, and they're really good for your health. Okay, the next question is about glucose regulation. And this is a pretty big topic. I'm not gonna cover all of it. I'm just gonna do the spark notes or the summary of what glucose regulation is influenced by. So insulin lowers blood sugar. It is released from the pancreas and the counterpart to insulin is glucagon, which raises blood sugar. These two hormones in the body are what regulate blood sugar. There are two conditions that result from abnormal blood glucose blood sugar levels. Hyperglycemia is when you have abnormally high blood glucose and blood sugar. It is different than hypoglycemia when you have abnormally low blood glucose and blood sugar. And both of them can really wear you out, wear you down, and make your quality of life worse. And it is important to try to regulate them if you can through your diet and through your food selections. The worst cases of abnormal blood sugar levels are with diabetes and diabetics. So the main difference between type one and type two diabetes is that type one diabetes is a condition where the pancreas just does not make insulin. So your body doesn't have insulin 
it can't lower blood sugar appropriately and it could lead to some very serious health issues in that way. And type 2 diabetes is when the insulin is there, it just doesn't work. And that is arguably worse because insulin has a very prominent role in health and type 2 diabetes is just as bad, if not worse, than type 1. Having diabetes can be very difficult. There are many ways to combat diabetes and here are some resources that might help. Having a regulated diet is probably the best tip I could offer. All right, carbs 101, carbohydrates. They're one of the three big macronutrients I already talked about. Carbs as a macronutrient are a huge part of life. Carbs are the major source of energy for humans. So there are a lot of different concepts that come into play with carbohydrates. I'm going to explain them all as best as I can in the rest of this video. Carbs can be classified in a few ways. There are simple sugars, known as monosaccharides and disaccharides. Monosaccharides have one sugar unit, disaccharides have two. Then there are complex carbohydrates, known as oligosaccharides, which have three to 10 sugar units, and polysaccharides, which have 10 plus sugar units. Once consumed, carbs can be used immediately for fuel or stored as glycogen in specific cells usually muscle and liver cells for later fuel. So carbs main use is as fuel and having enough carbs in your diet really is important so that you're at a high energy level. Monosaccharides, to give a more thorough explanation, are the only absorbable form of carbs, the single sugar unit. The structure of a monosaccharide is C6H12O6, so chemistry speak, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygen atoms. And this is the only absorbable form of carbohydrates. They are constructed as glucose, fructose, or galactose. Disaccharides, the two sugar unit, are also simple sugars. The three disaccharides are sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Disaccharides are made when monosaccharides form together. So there are three disaccharides. All three are made from a different combination of the monosaccharides. When glucose and glucose come together, it makes maltose. When glucose and fructose come together, it forms sucrose. And when glucose and galactose come together, it forms lactose. So the three disaccharides are all created from the three monosaccharides in different combinations. Another note on my disaccharide card that I feel was worth sharing is about sugars. So naturally occurring sugars found in fruits and milk are healthy because they come hand in hand with vitamins and fiber. Added sugars are bad. So added sugars are white sugar, brown sugar, syrups, honey, glucose, fructose, high fructose corn syrup. All of those added sugars are bad, but the actual naturally occurring sugars, like the ones in fruits and milk, are good for you. I think that's worth knowing because there is a lot of confusion about good versus bad sugar, and I want to say on the record that the sugar found in fruits and like natural sugars are really good for you, and it's just the added sugars that you should be wary about. You should not avoid all forms of sugar. And polysaccharides. These complex carbohydrates are formed when a starch, fiber, and glycogen molecule all combine. Remember, oligosaccharides are between 3 to 10. Polysaccharides can contain anywhere above 10. Polysaccharides are made when an amylose, amylopectin, and fiber molecule all combine together. Amylose are straight chain structures. Amylopectins are branched chain structures and fiber are block structures. This is what it looks like at a molecular level. So that's how the molecule gets its structure, and you don't really need to know that, but complex carbs are formed when a starch, fiber, and glycogen all get together. All right, now that we covered carb 101, it's time to go into carb digestion and absorption. The three macros are digested and absorbed in different ways. Here is how carbs are broken down. The first entry point is the mouth, where salivary amylase and the teeth break it down. Next is the stomach, where the gastric juices dissolve it. Third is the small intestine, 
where the carbs are broken down into monosaccharides. This is where the most nutrients are absorbed. Finally, the monosaccharides enter through the heptic portal vein, where they are transported to the liver and other cells for use. That was a long one, but that is the path that carbs take from digestion to absorption to you to be used as fuel. Boom! One card left. And the glycemic index. This is a chart that is used to compare different foods relative to how glucose filled they are. The glycemic index compares different foods in how they elevate your blood glucose levels. So one to two hours after eating these foods, they should elevate your blood glucose levels based on the number assigned to them. There are three columns, low, medium, and high. So there are about 20 different foods I have on this list and I'm going to read them out right now. Highest glucose is a 100, rice is a 91, Gatorade is an 89, oatmeal is a 79, french fries are a 75, and white bread is 70. Those are the high glycemic foods they might be what you expect. The medium foods start with popcorn at 65, raisins at 64, sweet potato at 60, honey and a Snickers bar are both 55. They are both on the cusp of being low. And the low foods, quinoa 53, peach 42, spaghetti 42, strawberries 40, apple 36, fructose 18, peanuts 13, and hummus six. Those are the low glycemic foods I have on this list. Here are more resources comparing more foods and how they stack up on the glycemic index scale. All right, people, Nutrition Q&A 7 done. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like. If you enjoyed that, check out another video here or subscribe for all of my stuff here. I upload every week. Follow me here. I post a lot. Thanks and see you next week.